Welcome to another episode of Conversations today. Oh, I forgot to ask you, do you want me to call you Karen C.L. Anderson? Is that yes, correct? <laughs> yeah. I meant to ask you if you wanted the C.L. Okay. Karen C.L. Anderson, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, so guys, we are going to talk about mother daughter relationships and not necessarily the great ones. Um, so Karen has written, a f- how many books have you written? Um, technically seven, five are in print. Wow. Oh my gosh. I think that that is such a big deal because it's one thing to have a book up here. And I've said this on multiple episodes. I just think actually putting pen to paper getting it all out there, going through, because that is, you have to be patient and you really need to think it through before you throw it out there to the masses. So I just think kudos to you. I think that's amazing that you did that. What prompted you to write a book about mothers and daughters and relationships? I've said this a million times before. Um, I have a mother (laughs) (laughs) and, um, at a certain point in my life, uh, I just noticed that, I don't know, I wasn't, I wasn't a happy person. And I, you know, in hindsight, after, um, you know, we grow up, we go to college or, you know, whatever it is we do, and we move on with our lives and we separate, right, from our Mm -hmm. our families in, in some ways, right? And the farther away I got in time and distance and, you know, separation from my mom, um, I started to notice like, oh, that wasn't right. Or like that, okay. was, that wasn't, there was something's wrong there. And uh, it took me, I think, longer than average to sort of, um, I mean, not that there's a, timeline normal, right but you know i'm kind of a late bloomer i think <laughs> <laughs> and um i yeah it, it's like as i started to get busy with my own life and do my own things the relationship that i thought we had seemed to just get worse and she seemed to become more upset with me more critical of me more just miserable and i you know it was, it's hard to sort of like put it succinctly because this took, you know, happened over decades. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, I, um, you know, it's like, you need that time and space away to sort of go and look at it and go, wait a minute. Okay. What's going on here? Did you have siblings? Yes. And no. Um, my parents got divorced when I was two. Oh, okay. And my mother and my mother married um, my stepfather when I was five and my father married my stepmother when I was also when I was five Mm -hmm. and my mother and uh, stepfather adopted a boy when I was nine and he was nine months younger and my father and stepmother had two children also when I well when I was nine and 11. So I have half siblings and I have an adopted brother. Okay. Did you notice? But I'm my mother's only child, only biological child, yes. So did your mom treat you differently than she treated your stepbrother? Adopted brother. Right. Or adopted, yes. Yeah. Um, Yes. Again, that's like a whole other sort of story. Mm -hmm. Um, There was a, a lot of issues that came up as a result of adopting somebody who um, was already, you know, uh, they weren't, he was, I think he was eight when I was, when we adopted him, but he was, he was only nine months younger than me. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he had a lot of issues, but (laughs) this was back in the seventies before people understood about things like and separation, uh, or attachment disorders, like all Mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Right. So, you know, they were sort of thinking, Oh, all you need is love. Right. Yeah. Well, Uh, yeah, I couldn't imagine I'd never adopted and I don't know anybody, you know, close, close to me that I can't imagine that. Would you remember, was your mom close with her mom? Like, do you remember your grandma all growing up? Was she? Yes. My grandmother actually died in 2015. So I was actually her legal guardian at the end of her life. Okay. 
but yes, my, um, there was no love loss between my mother and her mother, um, over the years, right? I, it's so funny you should say that because just, just yesterday, I realized how I kind of identify with my grandmother, but because I heard so many horrible things about my grandmother and, but from my mother, mm -hmm. like I have shame associated mm -hmm. with being like my grandmother. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, towards the end of my, one of the reasons I was my grandmother's legal guardian at towards the end of her life was because my mother and her didn't get along. Do you talk to your mom now? Not currently. No, she, this is, <laughs> um, let me give you the quick backstory. Oh yeah. So, you don't have to be quick. Do whatever. Go ahead. <laughs> so it was towards the end of 2010 that for me, it was like the straw that broke the camel's back. And up until that point, you know, it was like, I was trying to have this relationship with my mother and it just felt awful. Like, and I couldn't really put my finger on it. I didn't know what was going on. And at the time, um, and she still does, she lives about 300 miles from, mm -hmm. from me. And so it's not like, you know, I can just pop over there or vice versa. Um, but we had gone to visit her. Um, my husband and I had gone to visit her towards the end of 2010. Actually, it was, it was Thanksgiving time and, um, it was a terrible visit and we left early and, um, I don't know, about a month later, it, again, it was, I think it was like after Christmas, um, I was trying to reach out to her just to like, you know, I was just trying, 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 like, why, why, you know, if I'm just good enough, if I could just be who she wants me to be, you know, I could fix this. This is what I kept, you know, sort of thinking without really consciously thinking it. And she sent me an email that told me, and basically among other things, she said, I'm disappointed in the person you've become. Oh my gosh. And it was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. And at that point, I said, all right, fine, I'm done. And I sent an email back. It was funny because I had all this like mean and nasty things that I wanted to say. And I'm like, all right, delete, delete, delete. <laughs> backspace, backspace. It feels so good, though, doesn't it? <laughs> and then I just, I finally said, you know, based on what you've said here, I, I don't want to talk to you anymore. I'm done don't email me, don't call me. And so that was the end of 20, um, 2010. And the day before New Year's Eve, my father died unexpectedly of a massive heart attack. Oh, wow. Again, they were divorced, right? He was my go to. Um, so it was just like, uh, I mean, it was a real That's a lot. Yeah, heartache. I'm so sorry. Jeez. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Um, but anyway, so that kind of like set this whole thing forward for me. And I um, got some therapy <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, just found my way muddling through. I, I, I had started blogging the year before that. And, and so like when you were talking before about like writing books and stuff, um, that was even though I've been a writer as far as a career for pretty much my whole life, my whole adult life up until that point, I hadn't really written for myself, mm -hmm. but this blog was just sort of like where I poured out my heart and was figuring out my life and figuring out what's, what's what. And, um, so, you know, fast forward a couple of years. And, um, at that point, my grandmother, my mother's mother, you know, she was in her nineties and, um, because of time dis you know distance and and as i said some fractured relationships there um my grandmother asked me if i would become her legal guardian and i agreed and i i think that actually made my mother angrier oh sure it did um and but at a certain point in that time frame so somewhere around 2012 i think my mother sent me a letter and she said okay what are you going to do to fix this oh and it's interesting because it was around that period of time that I actually started, I was, I became very interested in life coaching. And I know like, you know, it's a kind of cliche these days, everybody's a life coach, but um, it was really, it, it gave me a whole sort of different framework to look at myself and how I was relating to others. Mm -hmm. And 
<laughs> I was kind of naive at the time, but I was like, okay, let me like just put on my little life coach hat here and see what I can do. <laughs> A little experiment. <laughs> and um, so we started, um, we started corresponding again, mostly like via email. And, you know, again, a couple years later, I, or I don't even know what the time frame was, but, you know, sometime later, I actually went to visit her. And we had, it was, you know, it was a nice visit, but it was also kind of tense and awkward. Um. And at a certain point, right, I'll just say it, the minute she started drinking, <laughs> it like turned into poison like immediately. Yeah. And, um, and I was like, yeah, no, okay. And, but, you know, we, we just started kind of like going forward in fits and starts. And um, there would be times where, you know, she would just tell me, you know what, you know, you make me uncomfortable. And she would just sort of like be quiet and not, I wouldn't hear from her for a while. And, um, but as I said, it was, and, and, and that's kind of just how it's been ever since. And I don't know, at some point last year, I did something or said something that she, I don't even remember now what it was, but she didn't like it. And so I haven't heard from her, <laughs> but like the way I, the, the, and so like, let's bring in like a little lesson here or a little like, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, tip or mm -hmm. something, right? Because I think a lot of us have, um, for a lot of different reasons, and again, different, depending on um, like different generational differences, right? Um, I think that there's a couple of generations, two, two or three generations of, of women who, when we'll say like, the silent generation and the boomers, right? And some mm -hmm. maybe Gen X, right? Who um, were brought up at a time when, and it, well, we still don't have equal footing in, right. in our culture, right? Um, and expectations and shame, and you will be like this and you can't be any more than that, right? And I think that, you know, gets in us and can then express itself in so many different ways addiction mm -hmm. personality disorders etc cetera, etc cetera, mental illness right like all of that stuff gets in and then you know it's it's like in there and then it can't change right and I, I, i'm not a doctor so i don't you know i'm not prescribing here or or diagnosing that's just the way i see it and so, you know, the disappointments, the, the trauma that so many of us experience and didn't know that we experienced, mm -hmm. right? It's all in there is sort of like this toxic brew. <laughs> right, right. And, and trauma is such a heavy word. So I think people think that trauma has to be something like sexual abuse no. or, you know, or, physical or abuse. Or yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like traumatic trauma where it actually could be just very passive aggressive comments or right. gaslighting. You know, that's what the term is now. Um, being with a narcissist, you know, it just somebody that just constantly poke, 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 poke is traumatic. And I think people may be like how you were at first thinking, no, this is just normal because that's all you knew. And until you got yeah. away from it, you didn't yeah. realize like, geez, that really could have messed me up bad the way that she was with me. So it covers a lot of different areas. It's not just something that has to be that extreme. Correct. Yeah. Did you think you, know you wanted to be close with your mom because you should should be close with your mom? You know, like um, that's everybody, you felt like, oh, why, what's wrong with me and my mom? I, I need to fix this because everybody else is close with their mom. Is that why you kept going back for more? Is just. I think, yeah, yes, that's like a surface kind of explanation, right? Like the Hallmark and, you know, Lifetime movies and like, right, you know, I mean, yes. that's what's held up as this, right? And that's actually part of the problem, right? Is that we like put mothers and on a pedestal but at the same time like but you don't have any power 
You're supposed to be this perfect thing, but not a real human being. Right. So, but you know, at the same time, right, when we're born, when any child is born, right, the attachment to the mother is critical because we need our mothers to basically keep us alive, mm-hmm. they need to feed us and keep us safe and warm and all the things, right? And so very quickly, a infant and as the baby grows, right, learns how to keep safe, how to stay safe. And the, that's what is so miraculous about the nervous system, right, is that it is constantly making adjustments to stay alive. Mm-hmm. And, and that's normal. That's brilliant. That's how we all work. And um, when a mother isn't healthy, and again, I'm not saying perfect here, right? There's a lot of room here. This is not about like, you're, you know, you're not a good mother because you're not perfect. I'm not saying that. Um, But what happens is when there are traumatic experiences, And that could be the divorce of your parents. It could be another baby being born. It could like, it doesn't necessarily mean that, but it could be, right? Mm -hmm. It could be your mother having a really terrible day and, and is upset or whatever. And her face is just blank and you don't get any reaction from her. Right. There's that study. I don't even remember what it was called, but it was like they did this study where they had mothers have like a blank face and the baby is like making these bids for attention. Oh, my and gosh. The mother's face just stays. And it's really it's fascinating. Right. It just really sort of shows how um, how fragile it is. But here's the thing. Everybody's going to have a bad day there's going to be a day where you blow up or you slam a door or you, you know, right. Mm -hmm. Here's what the difference is. A healthy mother knows how to repair that with her child. A healthy mother knows how to go back to the child and comfort the child and tell the child on a nervous system level, right? You are safe, even though that was scary. Mm -hmm. Right. You, and, 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 what ends up happening is when that repair doesn't happen and if it doesn't happen many times the child internalizes because it feels safer to do this that they are the problem and the reason that the child makes themselves the problem is because it's safer than having my mother be the problem because if my mother is the problem then i'm really yeah (laughs) right right (laughs) So was your dad your mother figure or was your grandma your mother figure or did you just never have a mother figure? I didn't have one. Wow. Wow. How, what did your grandma say about, cause she knew that this was all going on. Uh, my mom, she was very similar. My, my grandmother, this is just from me piecing it together. I'm not, again, mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. this is just my impression, right. but my grandmother was a pretty cold woman. Okay. I don't, here's another thing. I don't think my mother or my grandmother wanted to have children or at least not when they did with the men that they did. (laughs) And then here comes Karen. (laughs) But like my grandmother, my impression about my grandmother is that, you know, she was, um, she was, she had my mom, my mom was her oldest and she had her in 1940. And my grandmother was like a knockout. She was beautiful. She was like, she wanted to be an actress. She wanted to be a model. And nope, <laughs> that's not right. happening. Resentment. And I, I think there's some childhood trauma in my grandmother's background. Again, I don't have any proof. It's just a feeling I have. Mm-hmm. So when my mother comes along, I think my grandmother is sort of like resentful. Mm -hmm. And I also think she wants like a little robot child who will just like, I can put it to sleep and then I can wake it up. I can feed it on the schedule, right? Like it's going to be, and there, you know, I, I call that emotional trauma. There's right. There's a a total um, disregard for natural rhythms, Mm -hmm. uh, emotions, right? It's like, you know, not to mention that, a 
a lot of parenting books or parenting advice back at that time was written by Nazis. <laughs> oh my gosh. What? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Right. Like we will create the perfect child and you, you know, and they will then be productive, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Be <laughs> totally seen and discounting not heard and all that stuff. Exactly. Exactly. So what are your books? Are they helpful hints on how to get through it or what, what do you say in your books? So the most popular book is a book called Difficult Mothers, Adult Daughters, A Guide for Separation, Liberation, and Inspiration. And when I said before that I had seven books, five in print, the that book is a rewrite of a previous book. Okay. So, um, and that book is basically about how to so the separation in the title isn't about I'm never talking to my mother again. It's about who am I separate from my mother? What do I believe? What do, what are my values? Right. Um, who do I want to be in the world? Right. Apart from her, apart from her opinion of me, apart from what she taught me. I mean, maybe there are certain things that your mother teaches you that and I, I do, I have things that my mom taught me that I'm very grateful for. It's not like I hate her. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and so that's the separation piece, right? It is who am I separate from her? Um, then it's, and also then it's also healthy boundaries, learning how to have healthy boundaries. That's like a huge part of it. Then it's also about the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves mm -hmm. because of and this is the shame piece right which i i don't really you know call out in that book as much as i do in the more current book um but we we human beings right it it is uh it is built into us to make narrative to create story around mm -hmm. what's happening and so many of us um have stories about ourselves because of how our mothers treated us mm -hmm. right so part of the book is is learning how to tell a different story so it's not about oh yes i had an amazing mother <laughs> right mm -hmm. it's yeah these things happened it doesn't mean um i'll just use one of my stories right it doesn't mean i'm a pathetic loser right it's you know i, I mean I, it's not so much that you get rid of the story. It's like you relate to it differently. You stop, tell, you stop telling yourself that that's the only outcome that could be possible from having been raised by that woman. Right. Or that it's true. Or that it's true. Yeah. Just because somebody else says it or, you know, puts it out there. That doesn't mean that it's true. But we, when we internalize it, it feels true. Right. Right. Oh yeah. No, I'm not discounting feelings at all, <laughs> but that's what we do when we get in our heads yeah. we, because it's in there. We assume it's facts and yeah. that's where we get ourselves into trouble where you have to say to yourself, but, but is that true? No, I'm not a pathetic loser. I'm a good person. Yeah. You know, like it's not yeah. true. Right. Exactly. But it, again, it, until you can see that you even have the story rather than like you're walking because that's what what it felt like to me until i finally realized it it's like this is just who i am it wasn't that the words pathetic loser and i'm bad and i'm selfish and i'm a spoiled brat like that's a yeah. lot of my story right i didn't i wasn't consciously thinking those things it was just running the show in the background Okay. I had to become aware of my stories. That that's the painful part, but it can also be kind of fun. Um, <laughs> fun. <laughs> um, it's like, oh yeah, there's pathetic loser. You know. <laughs> yeah. <I> see you. <laughs> Was that all through therapy? Is that where it all started coming together, or did you realize no. it before? No, I mean. Therapy has played uh, an important role on and off throughout my life. Um, 
and coaching and, and, and the methods that I've learned and um, also learning about trauma and, and even, you know, although I'm not a therapist, I'm not licensed. Um, I have taken a lot of courses and, um, you know, learned from a lot of people who, um, who, t- you know, who teach in that realm. And again, I don't see my role as a writer or, you know, cause I do work with clients. I don't see my role as therapeutic at all. Right. I mean, or, you know, it's not that at all. It's more in teaching people, as I said, some techniques, some tools, um, and to have that trauma informed or trauma aware so that like, I, if I'm working with somebody, I can, you know, I can say, I, you know, if I meet somebody and I'll be like, you know what, you, you need more, like that's above my pay grade. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So what yeah. are some tips? What do you tell people? I know every situation is different, but is there, are, are there some general types of tips that you usually tell people? So, um, I, I, I take a sort of a three pronged approach. One is how can we create safety? in our bodies, right? And that is having just a, and I think all humans should have a basic understanding of how their nervous system works. And that information is everywhere. We can learn that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And to, to, to unshame our experiences, unshame. So, uh, you know, when we, when we understand trauma and we understand trauma response or stress responses, fight, flight, freeze, fawn, Mm -hmm. right. Is to unshame the fact that that's what happens in our bodies. Right. It's like, it's brilliant that you fight. It's brilliant that you run away. It's brilliant that you freeze. Freeze is my (laughs) go-to. Freeze (laughs) is my nervous system's go-to. Like that's how my nervous system has determined it's best. And I used to shame myself for that, thinking okay. I was weak and pathetic, right? Whereas my mom's is fight. Okay. Right? So um, so being able to say, oh, look at my brilliant body is taking care of me here. Not This doesn't mean that I am stupid. Right, right. Yeah, that's so true. So that's what I mean when I, you know, that's a tip that I, you know, work with my clients is how can we continually remind ourselves that we are safe and that whatever it is our bodies are doing to keep us safe isn't wrong Mm -hmm. because we want to make ourselves wrong for it. Right. And, and, And I would also say that a piece of that is um, because feelings, emotions are much, very much related to what's happening in our nervous system. And so anger, jealousy, disappointment, grief, like all the things that we're like, eh, I don't want to, don't, you know, that's not okay. Right. All of that is okay. Mm-hmm. Right. And it makes sense that we feel the way we feel. It makes sense that we're judgmental. It makes sense that we're angry. It makes sense that we think our mothers, whatever, right? Like, and so the, the, the more that we can normalize and unshame that we actually literally create, it makes our bodies go, oh, okay, she's got it. It's okay that I feel this way Mm -hmm. rather than like, oh, no, that's wrong. You shouldn't be doing that. Right. That just makes more stress. Right. So you know, there's a million and one <laughs> tools and tips for sure. creating safety. Part of it is that self-talk. Some of it is somatic. Some of it is, you know, I mean, quite literally padding mm-hmm. is a good way to bring yourself out of a freeze response. And again, we're not talking like a massive freeze response. I'm talking right. a little dissociation here and there, right? Um, you know, shaking it out. It's like when we're in fight or flight, we want to calm the energy. And when we're in our our freeze or people pleasing, we want to move the energy. Yeah. Yeah. I saw a video about that, about how people don't realize all that inside of us, all that energy, and it doesn't leave on its own. So sometimes you do just have to just move around, you know, whether it's in the shower or put on a song and just move your body, get that energy going so that it's not stagnant, staying in you, whether, you know, bad or anger or whatever, just to get things moving. 
And the thing is, so many women think I just need to calm down. And I agree that sometimes that's true. Mm -hmm. For a lot of us, we know we need to know how to get have access to safe anger. Mm -hmm. We don't need to always calm down. Sometimes we need to actually get a little like, right? Yeah, we need to have access to that. Mm -hmm. But so much so many of us shut that down because it wasn't safe. Right? Well, there's people that also keep the person, mom, dad, friend, whatever in their lives, even though it's something that makes them all tense and, and yeah. they don't ever make that break. Yeah. And sometimes even just a little bit of space probably would do more better than. Yeah. So, so that safety piece is like number one, number two is creating what I call an intentional identity. And it's not about changing who you are. It's just about remembering who you were before. And and maybe you'd think, well, it started when I was born. So how could I have been anything other? I believe that it's still in there. Right. And there's been a lot of adaptation and a lot of, um, you know, internalization. But I think most of us have access to memories of times in our lives when we were like in the flow and like the juiciness of who we are. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I I share, um, you know, sort of like four different things and it's in my more current book, which is called You Are Not Your Mother, Releasing Generational Trauma and Shame. Um, a little exercise in there of like how to tap into these different experiences that you can then look at that and remember and be like, what was alive in me in that moment? What was, what would somebody else say that they saw in me in that moment? Or, you know, what was I witnessing in myself that I loved so much? And those experiences hold clues for this intentional identity. And it's like who I want to be when shame's not running the show. The potential you. Yeah, but it's 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 not even, I think so many of us think that we're not there yet and we are. It's it's not, it's about having shame take a back seat so that that self can be there too, more obviously. Right, wow. And then the fourth or the third piece is, um, is creating healthy boundaries, right? And it, you can see that all three of these pieces just work sort of together. Um, some people gravitate and are like, yeah, I just want the boundaries, teach me the boundaries, but it's still, right, the intentional identity and the idea of like what it is that I value that informs how I set boundaries. How, how do I want my boundaries to be? And it's not just about what I want to keep out. It's also about what I want to cultivate in in my relationships and using my values as a um, a roadmap for that. Okay. What are your boundaries with your mom? Um, my boundaries. So let me back up and say that I see boundaries not as trying to control my mother. Mm-hmm. It's more um, like I'm not, I'm not available for that. (laughs) So I'm not available for, um, gossip about family. Mm -hmm. Um, I am not, I'm not into it to talk about politics. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't smoke around me, but you can smoke, but I'm going to go somewhere else. If you want to smoke, then, you know, Mm -hmm. um, the boundaries at this point are more energetic than anything. It's like, this is okay. That's not okay. Mm -hmm. But it's you go do you. I'm going to do me over here. Does that keep her calm? No. So if you say, uh, oh, you're going to smoke. Okay, that's fine. While you do that, I'm going to go out to my car for a few minutes or what, however. No, I, I don't say that. I mean, Again, I haven't talked, I haven't seen her in like since 2000, what is this, 22 maybe or 21? I don't even remember now. Um, it's energetic. Okay. It's, I don't say those things. And no, she doesn't like it and it doesn't keep her calm. But here's another really good tip. 
your mother's emotional life is not your responsibility. She gets to be upset. She gets to be angry. She gets to be disappointed in you. And that's not your job. <laughs> it's just not. Yeah. I mean, even if, you can't do it, right? It's impossible. Right, right. Yeah, like you can't make everybody happy. You can only you can't make anybody happy. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, it, and it isn't your job. I think that's a really hard lesson to learn. But because it's inside of us that if mom's not happy, I'm going to die. <laughs> Literally. Right. Right. Yeah. And from the get go, it's like, I'm going to die if she's not happy. That's why creating that safety and the self talk and to rem like when your lizard brain is like, ah, you're going to die, you're going to die. Right. It's like, I mean, literally, I always put my hand here. It's like, you got this. Yeah. She is very unhappy. She is very angry right now. And you're, yes, the body feels like, ah. Scared. Scared. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I, you know, last, I guess it was last August. Here, here's, here's, a, here's an interesting boundary that I had. Um, I was calling my mom every two weeks on Sundays. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's a long story, why we had gotten into that habit. And then it became obvious that like that wasn't really necessary. And what I noticed was that every time I called her every, every other Sunday, I would have like a pit in my stomach. Mm. I was traumatizing myself over mildly over right. and over again every right. other Sunday. And it's not that the conversations were necessarily horrible or anything. Some of them weren't great, but you just didn't just, want to. <laughs> I didn't want to. And it's not that I never wanted to talk to her. Mm -hmm. But I basically said, you know, what, I'm not going to call every two weeks, but let's, you know, just let's make this a more, you know, natural, whatever. Call me when you need something or sure. email me. And. <laughs> okay. And it, it became obvious over the course of several months because I like had emailed her a few times and nothing, nothing, nothing. And I noticed in my, this like urge, like, I got to make sure she's not angry at me, ah, you know? Mm -hmm. And every time I had to remind myself, that's not my job. That's not my job. It's not my job. I'm here when she's ready, but like, it's not my job. Yeah. Cause she's an adult, just she like you're an adult. And even if you're a child, it's still not your job to make your parent happy. It's they, definitely um, not. Yeah. Right. Right. So you also have your own podcast. Yes. What's it's it called? called? Dear, it's called Dear Adult Daughter. And it's a uh, bite size. Some of the episodes are really short. Most of them are, I don't know, five to 15 minutes long. <laughs> yeah. Are you liking it? Do you like doing I do. it? I do. Yeah. It's, um, I, I give myself permission to be very inconsistent. Mm-hmm. I don't, you know, I'm like, it's not every Tuesday or Friday or whatever. I just, right. whenever I feel like it. yeah, well, and that's as needed, you know, yeah. um, what was I going to ask you? Oh, oh, I was going to say that your books are probably almost like, uh, a journal, you know, like a diary, something where you were able to get it out all on paper, but that's so helpful for other people to, to read other people's stories, even if it's not the exact same story as yours. Just know, that feeling right? of, it's not just me. It's not just me out there that doesn't get along with my mom. Or I have a few friends that do not speak with their mothers. Yeah. It's, and I it's, had never heard of that before. I was like, oh, <laughs> what? It's way more widespread than you think. A hundred percent. I didn't realize it until it happened. And then I was hearing about it more and more, just like everything that happens in your life, you know, yeah. you've never yeah. heard of kidney stones. And then all of a sudden everybody's got kidney stones, but yeah. And so I was just like, wow, I, I didn't realize that. How hard is that for you? I'm so sorry. And they're like, don't feel sorry for me. Like that was the best thing for me that I could have done because it, it's not healthy to live in that fight or flight. Exactly. 24 seven, your nervous system is not supposed to be doing that. hundred percent. And, you know, I mean, it's funny when you said that about, you know, saying, I'm so sorry. It, I, I kind of sometimes have a visceral response to when I perceive that somebody pities me for this. Right. It's so interesting. Yeah. Right? 
Um, but then also there are the people who are like, well, but you only have one mother and you know, she's your mother and well, she raised you and she get, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> that like, please. When they don't know the story behind. Yeah. Um, when, and I think that it's not pity. I don't think that I think when I think it or say it to somebody, it's because if you have a really great relationship with your parental figure, then you feel bad for somebody that doesn't have that, not yeah. pity, but just like, oh, shoot, like you were, I'm sorry that that was the hand you were dealt because you yeah. deserve better than that. It's that it's, kind of thing. Yeah. And, but what's interesting, and I've learned that, but again, like one of my favorite questions to ask for myself or anybody who's going through this and is feeling like the reactiveness of it is to say like, what is the threat that your body is perceiving? And it's interesting because I've recognized that my body perceives what it, what I think of as pity, which you might not be intending pity. Sure. Right. But like my body perceives that as a threat. And, and it's just interesting for me to know that. Right. It's not like, I think that that's what you're thinking. It's yep. more like, but my, that's what my, and, and if I guess if I could leave anything with your audience, right. Is when you know yourself that clearly, right. It's like, and you know, it's, it's an ongoing process. I'll be doing it for the rest of my life. Right. Is getting to know it's a kindness to others. Mm -hmm. Right. Like it, it's, it's what helps us not take everything personally. <laughs> Right. Like, right. Oh yeah. That's, that's this piece inside of me that perceives pity as a danger or as a threat. I don't have to like snap at that person because they're saying, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, so correct me then what is a good thing or say nothing? What, what is a good thing to say to somebody that says, you know, I, I don't really have a good relationship with my mom or I don't speak with my Tell mom or dad or yeah. Like what is Tell me more? Like, tell me to, how do you feel about it? Are you happy that it's that way? Do you, are, is it, is it you know, better me, that way or? Yeah. Like, do, okay. again, this isn't a you problem, right? It's, we were all sort of in, taught, right? To have sort of knee jerk reactions to things. Mm -hmm. Somebody dies. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, maybe they're happy they died. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like. Yeah. You can't assume other people's feelings. I suppose that's the, yeah. the moral of the story. Right. So it's just a matter of, you know, find out how they feel about it first Ask and then questions. say, you know, but it, it went, another favorite question of mine is, um, do you just need to vent or do you want my advice? Mm. Right. Right. Yeah. You just need to talk about it. That's true. Yeah. Cause I think people, I worry about saying the wrong thing, but I think more people should worry about saying <laughs> like think about what's coming out of your mouth before you say it because you do yeah. you shouldn't come out with just what you're thinking right away listen to their story and that's awesome okay so tell people how they can find you and your books and all that good stuff your podcast so um my website is basically you know you can find everything you need there it's kclanderson.com and there's you know you can find my podcast on all the places um <laughs> But it's also on my website, like you can listen to episodes there and um, my books are on Amazon and uh, where other books are sold. <laughs> right, right. You're everywhere. Um, but yeah, that's that's basically me. I also send out um, I have a what I call my love notes that I send to my mailing list and with oh, news nice. and, you know, events and advice and, you know, all the stuff. Oh, I think that's great. It, Karen, thank you so much for taking the time. I'll put everything in the show notes so people can find you, but you were, got really raw. And I always appreciate that when people just kind of <laughs> just let it go. Not, you know, just it's like, going to help somebody. It's going to help somebody. That's been my journey um, is to be more and more myself. Well, so. you should be proud of yourself. Thank you. I am. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. And I will be in touch for sure. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.